Hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be with you all at the different times that you're joining us around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're really thrilled to be launching the 2020 edition of our Sustainable Development Report. Uh, just a couple of logistics as we're getting started. Unfortunately, given the very large number of people we have online, um, our participants are not going to be able to use their microphones and cameras, but there is a section in the GoToMeeting software where you can ask questions, you can type in your question, and we're going to um, sort of take them as they come in. And a short note that Professor Sachs will have to leave early, so if you have a question for him, um, please go ahead and send them in right as he's making his opening remarks. We'll try to take one or two quickly uh, before he has to sign off and we turn it over to our next speakers. So without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to uh, turn it over to Professor Sachs. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's global launch of the 2020 Sustainable Development Report. And I'm really uh, grateful uh, to all of the lead authors uh, of this report. I'd like to thank uh, especially Guido Schmidt-Traub, uh, Christian Kroll, uh, Guillaume Lafortune, uh, Grayson Fuller, and Finn uh, Wolin as the lead authors. There's a, a, a vast number of people who contribute, uh, and I'd like to thank all of the SDSN team and the SDSN networks uh, and so many uh, officials in governments around the world and in civil society that uh, give us ideas and feedback and comments uh, and corrections uh, throughout uh, the year as we work on uh, each annual report. Uh, this one was obviously, uh, as for all of us, an especially challenging report to work on because uh, the ground is shaking under us uh, as we think about the sustainable development goals. We've never had in our lifetimes uh, the tumultuous uh, events uh, of recent months, uh, the greatest, uh, most significant crisis uh, in the world since World War II, as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, has described it, the biggest economic upheaval since the Great Depression, uh, actually. So uh, this year's report uh, not only reviews all of the SDG indicators, but tries uh, as we're uh, participating in uh, and trying to make sense of this pandemic, uh, how COVID-19 uh, relates to uh, the SDGs. Uh, and there are certainly several ways uh, most importantly, as uh, the opening chapter explains, there are very, very heavy impacts uh, and mostly large adverse impacts uh, of COVID-19 on fighting poverty, uh, on hunger, on uh, jobs and employment, um, and uh, many, many uh, of the other aspects. Uh, two billion children suddenly were not physically in school. Uh, uh, the health disaster itself is not only uh, an epidemic of uh, infecting uh, probably tens of millions of people if we have the, had the right uh, measures uh, and uh, leading to the deaths of uh, a half a million confirmed uh, uh, cases uh, at this point but also impacting heavily the ability to control other diseases as well. So huge challenges for SDG 3. The second way that uh, the sustainable development goals are important is that they are guideposts for rebuilding. We know this epidemic will come to an end. It should have been controlled more decisively uh, in many places, including my own country, the United States, than has been true. Uh, but um, we have to not only be fighting the transmission of the virus itself, but thinking about how we're going to build back better. And the SDGs provide a very crucial roadmap for building the kind of inclusive, safe, resilient, environmentally sustainable societies that we want 
Uh, that was why the SDGs were adopted. Uh, in this way, they're more important than ever to uh, help us find that path forward. One of the lessons of this epidemic that is starting to be more and more clear is that it is the more unequal societies that are having a much harder time fighting this pandemic. Countries with high inequality of income and wealth like the United States or like Brazil or like Mexico uh, or other highly unequal countries don't have the social trust, don't have the social uh, networks uh, don't have the good governance and stability uh, and have too many vulnerable people. Uh, and the uh, result is that high inequality is showing heavy costs for society once again. And the sustainable development goals by emphasizing uh, the universal access to basic needs, to decent jobs, to education, to health care, to modern energy services provides a roadmap going forward. We also look uh, at other aspects of the efficiency of the response to the pandemic uh, in uh, a very preliminary snapshot that uh, only carries us uh, through the beginning of May, but we emphasize one overriding point. This pandemic in the end can only be fought through public health means. The effectiveness of uh, proper hygiene, people wearing face masks, physical distancing, uh, case testing, tracing, and isolating. Lockdowns of the economy may be short-run uh, desperate actions and often absolutely necessary, but they are not a substitute for public health. And so we put a strong emphasis on quality of public health in response. Korea is an exemplar of an excellence of public health response that has enabled Korea to uh, largely suppress the epidemic and to keep society open at the same time. And so this is uh, one of the early lessons that we have of this report. Finally, let me uh, note uh, one theme that uh, I find uh, every year persuasive and persuasive again this year. The top countries uh, in the overall SDG ranking this year, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Norway, Austria, Czech Republic, Netherlands, and Estonia, the top 10 countries are all European countries. Uh, the Northern European countries are at the top of uh, the charts. Uh, the social democratic ethos, as I like to call it, I, I don't mean a political party, I mean a way of thinking about society as socially inclusive, uh, where government has a large role to ensure universal access to healthcare, education, vacation time, family leave, sick leave, uh, other kinds of social protections, uh, has the overall best uh, performance in sustainable development. And not only in the social areas, but also in environmental management and aiming for a green economy. It is not a coincidence that 15 of the 15 top countries are all in Europe. Uh, and I think that this uh, provides uh, really some guidance uh, for us of the kinds of institutions to build social inclusion. They haven't guaranteed necessarily a completely effective response against COVID, uh, because that's about public health to a very important extent. Some have done well, others not quite so well, in fact. But in terms of overall social inclusion and uh, building green, the two fundamental pillars of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement, I think that there's a lot to learn from these very high performing countries. Well, I want to thank my colleagues once again, uh, and I want to thank uh, everybody for participating. Uh, we're really in a period of uh, tumult, and so we really need guideposts for us, our goals, the future we want, uh, and the metrics to help us get there. Uh, and that is the spirit in which we uh, introduce the 2020 Sustainable Development Report. Thank you very much, and back to you, Lauren.
Uh, Jeff, I'm going to throw you one question. Uh, hopefully, it's a complicated question, but maybe you can give us uh, a concise and insightful answer. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> on the implications of COVID-19 for globalization and the future of global supply chains. What have we learned these past couple months? First of all, our supply chains are now strongly virtual supply chains. So one of the things we've learned is that one can actually lock down an economy. And while we lose a lot of the things that we really love in daily life, uh, going uh, for walks or to restaurants uh, or to our local shops, a vast proportion of the economy continues to operate from home or online. One of the things that we've learned from this pandemic is that we have been pushed more rapidly than we could have imagined into a digital age. We were already obviously moving towards a digital age, but it has dramatically accelerated. It is for this reason that I am very skeptical of claims that suddenly we are going to deglobalize or localize supply chains. In a digital world, our supply chains, including our offices, are virtual and online and global. Uh, every day, uh, I have the experience of having meetings, brainstorming, uh, workshops, education uh, activities that are global. Uh, and I believe in the digital age that this globalization will continue because it is mutually beneficial for the world. Uh, of course, the pandemic has locked us up even in our homes or our rooms in many cases for several weeks. So we've been dramatically localized in one sense. But the gains and benefits of globalization are so profound that we should not uh, squander or lose sight of the benefits of an interconnected world. We should use global connections indeed to fight the pandemic more effectively. We should understand that in a digital world, we're going to have a continued uh, global economy. We're gonna do things in a different way, uh, but many of the new ways of doing things, uh, e-commerce, e-banking, uh, e-health, uh, e-education, are gonna be even more global less uh, rather than uh, less global. So my answer, uh, Lauren, is that uh, <clears throat> while there are certainly some areas where uh, production will move uh, closer to home, renewable energy being one of them, rather than shipping fossil fuels halfway around the world, uh, people will tap into their wind and sunshine uh, at home. For many, many things that we do and want to do, we will continue to be a global economy, a lot of it online, but for uh, mutual benefit. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, joining us this course. morning. We know you have to sign off soon, um, but thank you. It's wonderful that we were able to have, you know, three authors of the report online at the same time, you, Christiana and Guillaume. So now I will turn it over to Guillaume, who on behalf of the three of you uh, is going to present some of the key findings from the report. And we'll give you a moment to set up your screen share, Guillaume. And I have to make you a presenter. Apologies, we're all waiting on me. <laughs> there we go. Great, and we can see your slides, so I will turn it over to you and mute myself. Thank you very much, um, Cheyenne. Thank you also, Jeff. Um, Thank you also to our distinguished speakers today, Ambassador Ho Yeon Chu uh, from South Korea, Minister Solström uh, from Sweden. Also great to have Dr. Christian Kroll, who's the co-scientific director of this publication with Dr. Guido schmidt as well. Um, and obviously thank you to all of you for, for joining us uh, today. Um, my name is Guillaume Laporte and I'm a senior economist in the, um, in the SDSN and I coordinate the annual production of um, the Sustainable Development Report, which 
tracks the performance of all um, UN member states um, on the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so this year's edition is special, and I think that reflects the special situation that, uh, that the world is in. Um, it focuses, um, the opening sections focus on um, the SDGs and um, COVID-19. Um, so what I'll do in the next 15 um, to 20 minutes is to walk you through some of the key findings and the key um, charts and results of the, of the publication. Uh, a lot of those slides will echo um, some of the things that were, that were said by Professor Sachs um, just, uh, just before. Um, but before I do this, let me just put this report in, um, in a broader um, uh, context of the set of monitoring tools and accountability tools that we've built, be, been building over the years in close collaboration with our um, networks and partner institutions to really make the SDGs um, a, um, a tool for uh, monitoring and accountability. So we do um, those annual report that we present um, every year um, since 2015. So this is the sixth um, edition um, of the report. But we also do increasingly regional or, or continental editions of the, of the report, which are produced in very close collaboration and sometimes even led by our uh, networks uh, and partner institutions. So we've done reports for Africa. We're actually launching the third edition of this um, report on, on July um, 15th. We've done a report for um, the Mediterranean uh, region, the Arab region, for Europe, and we just launched two weeks ago a report for um, Latin America. And these reports really help contextualize a little bit more some of the issues. They also um, help us leverage some of the wealth of data that's available at the regional level. Right. Um, so if I, if I take the example of the European report we released last November, we could obviously leverage the wealth of data produced by the European Commission and the fantastic work done by Eurostat and other um, agencies of the European Commission, something that we cannot do um, at, the global, at the global level. And then finally, we also um, use the SDGs as a monitoring tool at the subnational um, level. So for provinces, region, and uh, cities, municipalities. I think there's a broad consensus that we won't make any major breakthroughs on the SDGs without um, the strong involvement of um, local policymakers and, and, and mayors. Um, and so it's important also to translate the goals at the subnational level. So we've done a report over the past four or five years for US cities, um, Italian cities, Spanish cities, European capital cities, and we're working with a lot of um, other partners throughout the world um, uh, on this. Um, the, the common feature of these reports is that we um, calculate distance to SDG targets. We map, we map out the best available indicators. Uh, we aggregate results at the goal level, and we estimate when possible um, whether countries or cities are on track or off track for achieving the SDGs based on um, the past year's trend. And we always include, obviously, policy sections that discuss a bit more in details the key lessons um, and, um, and, and, and findings uh, from, from these assessments. Um, to mention that the methodology is now, in our view, relatively stable. As you see here, we've been working on this for many years. It's been published in the peer-reviewed literature, and we have also taken the step to get um, audited uh, independently and, and statistically by the European Commission Joint Research Center. So I'm jumping into this year's edition of the Sustainable Development Report. And if we summarize, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna show afterwards uh, charts and slides that illustrate each of these findings, but here, I want to focus on six key findings um, from the report, and again, that echo a lot what Professor Sachs just said um, before. The first finding is that the highest priority for every government must remain the suppression of the pandemic. Uh, and there, there can be no economic recovery while um, the pandemic is raging. So one of the hypotheses of the report is that public health right now is probably one of the most important tools for sound uh, macroeconomic um, policy. Um, and here it echoes also a lot of the uh, statements that were made, including by the chief economist of the um, of the IMF, the chief economist of the of the OECD, uh, of the OECD when they launched um, the um, their their respective economic outlooks, where they basically say that look, the future is very um, uh, unpredictable. There's lots of uncertainties. Um, and also that a lot of the growth projections depend on whether we're able to suppress the, the disease and uh, implement um, effective uh, public health uh, measures. So depending if we have a second wave, a third wave, a fourth wave, this will necessarily have implications on, on growth, but also on, on the SDGs. Um, and so the hypothesis is that the countries that are best able to contain the virus, obviously in an absence of a treatment or a vaccine, uh, will also see um, the, the fastest economic um, uh, recovery. 
The second finding is that COVID-19 has short-term negative impacts on most SDGs, and these impacts are amplified for the most um, vulnerable groups. And here, by vulnerable groups, I mean groups within countries, um, so the poorest, low-skilled labor, the migrants, um, but I also mean the most vulnerable um, country, right? So low-income countries, countries that might already be uh, facing some turmoil, political, economic, social turmoils, um, and countries that might be in, in, in conflict. The third uh, finding is that the SDGs and the six SDG transformations can help build back better. So that's the roadmap that Professor Sachs was, was referring to. Um, so that means greener, um, fairer, and um, more resilient. So we argue in the report that the recovery will be investment um, led um, and that this should provide an opportunity to target some of the investments towards the achievement of sustainable and inclusive um, development and so we provide a six transformations uh, framework to support these efforts and we describe in the report what economic recovery plans compatible with the um, sdgs might look like the fourth finding is that countries in asia pacific have progressed most on the sdgs since 2015 and that they also responded more effectively so so far to the covid 19 outbreak so what we've done in the report this year is to calculate retroactively um, the sdg index using this year's uh, measures and we see that um, countries in asia pacific have progressed most since 2015 and we're also uh, publishing as mentioned by professor Sachs, a pilot index of the early covid 19 response for 33 oecd um, uh, countries the fifth finding is that rich countries generate negative spillovers that undermine other countries' ability to achieve the goals and may increase the likelihood of um, future uh, pandemics. And then the sixth finding is that we need more and not less um, global partnerships and uh, collaboration. And we um, mentioned in the report five key measures that global cooperation um, should include uh, to address the health and, and, and economic crisis. Um, so, and here I'm going to go through some of the, the key charts, the key fig figures of the of, of the report. So the first uh, the first finding and, and is that COVID-19 has negative short-term impacts on, on most of the SDGs. Actually, when we started drafting this report back in March or April, we used the future tense will have, um, but some of the impacts are very tangible and and visible and visible. Um, and I think here, I mean, we've, we've made a, we've reviewed, uh, we made a comprehensive review of the literature and also use our expert judgment. Um, and we see that no goals are clearly positively um, affected by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, we see the most negative impact on SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 3, SDG 8, and SDG 10, broadly related to um, poverty, um, uh, hunger, uh, health, uh, economic growth, and, and inequalities. We see moderate or mixed impact for some other SDGs. And then we see the impact being unclear for SDG 12 to SDG um, 15. So on one hand, there's been short-term gains in terms of CO2 emissions or, or, or pollution. But at the same time, we see that as countries are reopening uh, the economy, um, we see um, those uh, emissions picking up relatively fast and sometimes being um, uh, higher than um, the, previous, the previous year for the same uh, period. And we also um, see a risk that as countries are looking for ways um, to mitigate the impact on, on jobs, on unemployment, and boost economic growth, um, that the implementation of climate and biodiversity conventions and strategies, including on deforestation or plastic use, might slow down. And we see some signs of that uh, happening throughout the world. So for this reason, we, we, we consider that the impact here is unclear for SDG 12 to SDG 15. Um, we also present the very first um, and pilot assessment of countries' early response um, on uh, COVID-19. Um, and here we focus on 33 OECD um, countries, and the model takes into account both health and economic considerations. So we focus on OECD countries because these are the countries where we had the most comparable data and because they were hit more or less at the, at the same time um, by, the, by the virus. Um, we excluded here the OECD lag countries, so Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, which were hit um, at the later stage. We focused here on the period March 4 to May 12. So that's really a snapshot for a very uh, specific uh, period, and it's meant to be replicated uh, in the future. So this is not uh, final, it's meant to be um, replicated. And this is really our contribution to the emerging debate on lessons learned um, uh, for the first couple of months of the, of the pandemic. Um, so the detailed methodology and the, and the maths behind it are, are, are explained in section 1.2 of, of the report. But so we acknowledge that COVID 
19 represented obviously an unprecedented challenge for many countries. This is a, obviously a new um, coronavirus. Um, pretty much everyone was susceptible to be infected at the start of the pandemic um, as populations were not immune to it. And the other big challenge is that it's a, it's a, it's a virus where there's a lot of asymptomatic that are spreading the, the, the virus without knowing it. But what we've tried to do here is to assess which, assess which countries were best um, able to contain uh, the virus by containing mortality rates and the effective reproduction rate, while also mitigating the impact on the economy, um, measured in the model by the decline in mobility taken from Google mobility data. And what this preliminary assessment shows is that countries in Asia Pacific, especially South Korea um, and some Baltic states, performed best in the very first few months of the pandemic, um, as they were able to largely um, suppress the pandemic in a rather efficient way. So in the case of South Korea, social distancing, the widespread use of protective uh, personal equipment, um, the testing, tracing, isolating um, affected patients, and also the use of uh, technologies, new technologies, is probably all part of the, of the success. Other countries, as we can see here, um, were less able to mitigate health impacts and economic impacts. Um, now, having said that, um, we also mentioned in the report that strict and prolonged lockdown contributing to saving uh, possibly many lives, especially in countries where test kits and protective personal equipment were missing um, and where there were obviously risks that hospitals and intensive care units become overburdened. And many governments have also learned for the first couple of months of the pandemic and increased their ability to test rapidly, um, but also increase the widespread use of protective personal equipment. Um, there's obviously contextual factors that might explain the differences in this in this uh, index, including you know the timing at which countries were impacted, the age pyramid, the differences also in the data, uh, how data are compiled, include, compiled including on mortality rates. Um, but again, just to put things into perspective, um, so our assessment covers March 4 to May 12. As of May 12, um, there were below six per million um, deaths due to COVID in South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. It was more than 400 per million in a number of Western um, European countries. So here we see that Korea, South Korea, and we're, and we're grateful to have a representative from South Korea with us today, is an outlier in the positive sense. And we also see that in the, the, the GDP forecast released earlier this month, or now past month actually, or so earlier in, in, in June, we see that Korea was also an outlier on the GDP forecast for, for, for 2020. So that just, um, emphasizes the fact that the response of South Korea, um, South Korea was more effective to mitigate the health, but also the economic impact from, from COVID-19. Another finding of the report is that the measures that we had before the pandemic um, that would cover SDG 3.D, which um, calls for strengthening the capacity of all countries for early warning, risk reduction, and management of national and global health risks, the measurement that we had before are poorly predicted predictors of um, the effectiveness of the management of um, COVID-19. Um, so we see here, and this is the result of the Global Health Security Index, which was released in no November 2019. And this is a report, for instance, that was um, waived by some uh, policy leaders to mention that they were um, uh, leaders when it comes to uh, the, the preparedness of their, of, their, of their country to face pandemics. We see that here the United States and the United Kingdom were at the top, we're topping these indices of global health security uh, before um, COVID-19. And we see that the country like South Korea performs much lower. Um, it's also the case for New Zealand, Japan, or, or, or Vietnam. And on the right side, what we've done in the report is to compare, um, and, and here we focused on one sub-pillar of this index, where also the United States was topping the, the, the sub-pillar on detection and reporting. We compare the performance of the, of the index Two, how fast were countries able to test a significant uh, proportion of their population, right? So these are the curves that you see um, here. And we see that for March, there's a relatively big gap between um, the cumulative tests performed uh, as a share of the population by the United States versus South Korea and Germany, despite the United States performing better on the detection and reporting pillar of the Global Health Security Index. So here there's two hypotheses. On one hand, it could be that the GHS might have overestimated the ability of some countries um, to face these types of pandemics, even though the framework of the GHS and a lot of the data um, is very relevant actually for the current pandemic. Um, the other interpretation is that the response to a pandemic depends a lot also on political leadership and coordination. Um, and, uh, and so this is something that is obviously very hard to anticipate for the, the authors of the GHS. The broader lessons is that 
um, as we, we, we start learning the lessons, we might um, want to explore ways to better capture and better measure the level of preparedness of countries, reconsider some of the metrics that, that matter most um, in light of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And for the moment, uh, we haven't been using, for instance, this measure as part of the SDG index and, and dashboard. Um, the report also goes into um, how to build back uh, better. Um, and we argue that this is a type of crisis that requires extensive government support. Um, and to limit the impacts on livelihoods and avoid widespread uh, bankruptcies while obviously strengthening uh, public health systems and prevention programs. Um, the absence of this support would most likely result in a much more uh, prolonged uh, crisis. So it gives an opportunity for governments to guide the recovery through investments that support a greener, fairer, more resilient society. And we provide a six transformations framework um, that are underpinned by two overarching principles to help guide uh, the recovery. The report also dis discusses some of the do's and the don'ts of a, a sustainable and inclusive recovery um, and what a, a, a government response compatible uh, with the SDGs might um, look like. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a roadmap um, that we provide in the, in the report and, and how the SDGs can be used. Um, we also identified five key measures um, for global um, cooperation moving um, forward. Um, and so one is to disseminate best practices um, rapidly um, to address the health consequences of the virus and strengthen public um, health. And obviously this uh, requires a strong leadership from an organization like um, the World Health Organization. We also argue that there needs to be a strengthening of financing mechanisms for developing um, countries. So a lot has already been done, including by, by, by the MMF, um, but there might need to be some further support to low-income countries and countries that are at risk of sovereign default and, and financial collapse. And the role of the G20 here is, is also uh, probably also key. Um, the third um, key measure is to address the hunger uh, hotspots um, to avoid a massive humanitarian crisis. The fourth is to ensure um, social protection. And I think one of the things that this crisis has shown is that some of the countries that um, had um, uh, very effective social safety nets um, were probably better equipped to face um, and respond to these types of, of pandemics. Some things that an organization like the International Labor Organization have been advocating, of course, for, for many, many years. Um, and then the fifth finding is that once treatment and vaccines will be available, they should be um, obviously uh, rolled out um, uh, widely, including to um, low income and, and, and developing um, countries. Um, we uh, present uh, trends over time of the SDG index. Um, and one of the key message of the report is that um, the COVID-19 should not dismantle all the SDG efforts and the momentum that took place since their adoption in 2015. So we calculated population weighted um, averages of the progress um, since 2015 on the SDGs. And we see that all uh, major regions have made progress. It doesn't mean that all countries have progress. And we show in the report which countries have progressed most and which ones uh, went uh, a little bit backwards. Um, but overall, we see a positive momentum um, that should be continued. And that's why the decade of action is obviously um, absolutely absolutely key um, and um, so we've also looked at we've also presented the findings in longitudinal lines um, taking a longer time span since 2010 and um, both for region but also by income um, um, level where we show progress um, over time and here we see that the most progress happened on SDG 1 no poverty SDG 9 on innovation and industry even though here the spread across high income countries and lower income countries is, is remains quite large uh, but still we see overall quite good progress on SDG 9 and then SDG 11 related to responsibilities uh, responsible cities and communities um, we see the least progress on SDG 2 with rising obesity rates in parts of the world and also rising undernourishment in other parts of the world and then um, also uh, the least progress on SDG 15 related to uh, biodiversity. So as mentioned by, by, by Jeff, this year the index is topped by Sweden, Denmark and um, Finland. This is no not such a big um, news, but I think it's always good to remember and emphasize the fact that the Nordic model um, seems to be very compatible with the spirit and the content of the, of the SDGs. Most of the top 20 here uh, are uh, OECD countries and high income countries. That doesn't mean that there are no challenges in these countries. Um, and I think this is why um, the detailed dashboard are, are very important here, because we see that 
and when we look at this, we see that all countries, all OECD countries face um, major challenges in achieving at least two goals. So those are the red dots here in this chart, but also that no country is actually on track um, or was on track because this is essentially pre-COVID, um, was on track to achieve um, the, um, the SDGs. And for OECD countries, we see three broad types of challenges, one related to the sustainable diets, obesity and um, sustainable agriculture covered under SDG 2, the issue of um, inequalities, SDG 10, um, and then goal 12 to 15 related to climate and biodiversity action. Um, another challenge for high income countries, OECD countries, um, and also G20 countries is related to the spillovers. Um, so the report measures also um, the impacts that might be outsourced to other countries. So it's one thing to decarbonize domestically, but if this is achieved by um, outsourcing cement or steel to another country and re-importing the production, the SDGs being a global responsibility, this is not um, a practice which is compatible with the, with the SDGs. And so we have the econometric tools now to measure some of those impact and attribute the responsibility of some of CO2 emissions, scarce water, and other social impacts to the importing, the consuming um, country. Uh, we also include other types of, uh, of measures, including on the exports of um, major conventional weapons. We include measures related to financial um, uh, secrecy, tax havens, but also positive spillovers like official development assistance. And we, we created an index with those measures and we plot it to GDP per capita. And what we see is that high income countries um, tend uh, to generate the highest level of, of uh, spillover um, effects. Um, and we also present this here for the first time in the report trends over time on spillover measures and consumption-based measures. So that concludes my, my presentation for today. Just to say that the report can be downloaded uh, for free on our website. We have a much improved data visualization tool also um, that allows you to actually select countries for each specific indicators and compare um, your country um, to, to, to other countries for each single metrics. We present the results in a very detailed uh, way in the report. Uh, we have detailed country profiles. I, I show the example of, of France because that's the, the country I'm in right now, uh, but we have detailed country profiles for all 193 UN member states, and also we have averages for UN regions and also by income um, level this year. Um, and finally, let me mention that um, we have just released a new um, course on measuring sustainable development. So this is the team in the SDSN, um, the SDG uh, Academy, and enrollments are, um, are uh, open, and the course will start on July 15 and remain available for a year. Thank you uh, very much. Um, here are my contact information. Thank you so much, Guillaume. And I'm going to suggest maybe that um, I'll put that into the chat so that people who want to contact you um, don't need to worry about you taking the, the screen down so fast. Um, we're going to save the questions to the end. Uh, we've been getting a lot of really great questions, and we look forward to getting through as many of them as possible. But first, we're going to have some reactions from our country representatives. I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Oh, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Korea, which, as we just saw, ranks number 20 in the report. They are the top country in Asia. Um, and I think it's also exciting to note that East and Southeast Asia is the region that progressed the most um, so far over the past five years on achieving the SDGs. So very much looking forward to your remarks, Ambassador O. Thank you, um, Lauren. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> I haven't um, completely waked up. <clears throat> um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs and um, two authors. Uh, and as well as a uh, SDSM, SDSM team and the participants. Good morning. Although I'm being shown on the screen under my colleague's name, Kim Sung Jun Kim. My name is Hyun Ju Oh, and I just um, uh, newly joined the mission actually three months ago, just um, a couple of days after the homestay order was placed in New York. <laughs> and I lived in, in, in this virtual world since then. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate you all on the, um, the launch of the report, the 2020 Sustainable Development Report. And I also uh, would like to thank you for having me here on this such a wonderful occasion where I'm honored to have a, a firsthand uh, <laughs> key findings, to hear about the firsthand of the key findings of this report. 
<clears throat> it's been almost six months um, since the, the first um, the findings of the disease of unprecedentedly grave scale in nature. And um, COVID-19 certainly pushed us into a uncharted history, an uncharted territory and history as well. But um, as um, um, the Professor Sachs pointed out that we have a roadmap uh, to navigate um, this uh, crisis. And um, maybe we just forgot that we have a very strong tool and very accurate a device that we can uh, navigate uh, through the crisis to know that uh, where we stand and where we need to go. But I think it's the, 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 the launch of the, this report and um, the occasion of this seminar uh, just remind us of, of the fact that we have a tool and um, we have a very strong indices and the dashboards that can serve as our um, navigation uh, system that uh, to lead us uh, out of this crisis and also to lead us to the, the role that we can build back better. Um, I have to admit that as a representative of, of, uh, of Republic Korea, I was particularly uh, drawn to uh, the, the conclusion of the chapter one, uh, which compares the early COVID-19 um, control in OECD countries, and I feel very proud of the recognition of the achievements of to some uh, some achievements so far uh, in terms of the the effective um, uh, control of the pandemic. But at the same time, I feel very humbled uh, by the weight of responsibility towards the Korean people as well as uh, the international uh, community, as we are witnessing the, the the crisis isn't over the virus is still here and my president always keeps saying that um, it isn't over until it is really over and um, I think this pandemic um, is 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 under control in a certain parts of the world but it's still uh, going around in most of the uh, most of the most part of the world. Uh, so, with this in mind, I uh, would like to share with you uh, some of the experiences that we had in the early stage of the crisis, because the Korea was hit hard uh, in the early stage of the uh, crisis, and um, I, I was happened to be in Seoul in the foreign ministry dealing with the, all um, the, um, the contributions that we can make. Uh, towards towards Korea, uh, towards uh, the world. So I think it's uh, I I can have uh, some hands-on experiences uh, to share with you uh, this morning. So I'd like to uh, introduce a little bit of um, the Korea's response to the COVID uh, itself, as well as um, our preparation uh, to recover from from the pandemic. So to, be, to begin with, I'd like to explain the, the Korea's response to COVID-19 with the five letters, T-R-U-S-T, which is spelled trust. I think the trust is, is very important. It is important element that can describe the overall Korea's uh, response. Public trust in government's action is, is very crucial. And also the government's trust in the individual uh, actions, individual population uh, for the collective action is very much uh, crucial in implementing the, um, the, the health measures and all the precautionary measures. So the five letters which constitute trust stand for transparency, re rapid response, united action, and science and together in solidarity. I cannot share all with you in the interest of the time saving today, but uh, I can share some of the um, the messages that those letters uh, are standing for. The first principle that uh, we have to keep in mind in dealing with this crisis is the transparency. So this is one of the principles that underpin the, the overall actions of the Korean government. So from the very early stage of the of the pandemic, 
the Korean government has tried to keep the public fully informed. Um, since the day one, the press briefings have taken a place twice a day without any um, uh, interruption. So the briefing was held by, the first one was held, uh, presided by the, the chief of the KCDC. And the other is, is provided by the uh, uh, vice minister, vice health minister. So chief of KCDC has briefed the public about the, um, the overall status of the disease, including number of uh, the confirmed cases, including the number of hospitalization, as well as advice how to respond, how to prepare from the perspective of individuals, perspective of every citizen. And the vice health minister uh, served as a um, um, spokesperson of the interministerial committee, crisis management committee, which was uh, founded just right after the uh, crisis and chaired by the PM, uh, briefed us, briefed the public that uh, the how, what kind of measures the government is is going to take, and uh, what kind of um, uh, uh, the recommendations that they are going to present to the public to uh, the, to to avoid uh, of being affected, and so. As such, the information about the disease itself, the nature of this virus, and as well as the, all the measures and plans which will be taken by the government are fully shared with the, with the public since day one. And the second principle is that um, the rapid response. The virus travels very fast, you know, and um, the government has had to act even faster. Uh, otherwise, the public health uh, uh, capacity and institutions will be overwhelmed uh, by virus. So the government uh, has taken uh, all available measures to, to flatten the curve by carrying out robust testing, tra tracing and uh, treating efforts, which we call three T's in the short. So among others, massive aggressive, innovative, vigorous testing was the key <clears throat> to flattening the curve. The testing is central because it detects, it detects early at the early stage of the disease and also it minimizes the spread and also it can lead to the treating people in the early stage of infection. Um, thirdly, uh, I can say that um, the United Action was the key to the, um, the tentative success of Korean uh, dealing, Koreans dealing with the crisis. When the first COVID was case, COVID case was confirmed in a neighboring country, the first action of the government was to call out a meeting at the, uh, the Seoul Central Station <laughs> with the, the, all the research institutions and um, the biometric companies. And the government um, encouraged them to uh, develop test kits as soon as possible. And they uh, promised uh, uh, emergency uh, approval. So the government, uh, the work started working together with uh, all public uh, uh, institutions as well as the private companies to develop uh, uh, and supply test kits. And I think it's, that was a very important moment. In the, in the whole process of our tre uh, treating the, the, this pandemic. And the public awareness and the civic participation were also crucial. And the Korean people were very eager to know the nature of the virus itself. And also they want to know how we can uh, prevent from the spread. So they have actively employed the personal hygiene uh, measures and also sanitary measures and follow the uh, government's uh, recommendations uh, very faithfully. And also they uh, uh, follow the, the rules of such as voluntary testing, self-quarantine and, and other timely protective measures. And two other uh, the principles, the, the science-based approach and the togetherness in solidarity are very uh, self-explanatory uh, so I can uh, just uh, skip those, and I uh, want to, uh, to share the, a little bit of um, our uh, the plan to move forward. Um, Korea 
the, the one of the characteristics of, of the measures we have taken is that we haven't placed total complete lockdown uh, since the outbreak. So the cafes, restaurants were open, shopping malls were open. Even if the government just advised the people to avoid crowded places and to wear masks, and uh, they closed some of the, the public uh, facilities, they never placed the complete lockdown and they never um, they, uh, they placed uh, the travel restraint. So in to a very limited, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the economy, the act economic activities uh, uh, were, were running uh, even during the, the crisis, although it's not um, into the full capacity. So uh, even if we expect a certain contraction in economy, I think at some um, we tried hard uh, to not, I mean, not to turn this contraction uh, into a long-term uh, recession. So in order to boost the domestic market, the Korean government has taken rapid and bold emergency uh, fiscal measures, including um, three stimulus packages. So those stimulus packages aim to provide a, a financial support to households as well as uh, the small uh, businesses. And um, the government also tried to uh, promote the retention of, of employment. employment. So there wasn't any massive layoff during and just right after uh, the crisis. And also try to strengthen the economy and invest in anticipation of the post COVID-19 era. But um, uh, the Korean government is taking uh, this crisis as an opportunity to transform our economy. And um, uh, at the heart of uh, such efforts lies the we call the Korean New Deal, and which uh, specifically highlight importance of of uh, incorporating the green element in the New Deal uh, package. Uh, so we will focus on investment and job creation in a, a green sector as a as a strategy to, for sustainable recovery. The details of this green new new uh, green new deal is being fleshed out, but the basic uh, premise is very clear: that uh, we must ensure that the short-term recovery measures are aligned with our longer-term uh, ambition to tackle climate change and also the carbonization. So we try to uh, uh, transit uh, our economy into a low low carbon and a more green uh, economy. So this is the uh, the short overview of the Korean mm. uh, response to pandemic in terms of the public health as well as um, economic uh, uh, issues. And I uh, was looking for, um, look for the, the further uh, communication with the audience to explain that some of the measures uh, of the Korean government has taken. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Oh, and I think your comments on um, sort of solidarity and trust are really resonating with a lot of our participants. There are a bunch of questions and comments um, saying that one of the many positive things for um, East and South Asia has been the sort of solidarity of the population in, in coming together to handle COVID-19. So I definitely think Korea has been a leader in that. Um, I will turn it over to Ola Solstrom, who's the Minister Counselor for Sustainable <coughs> Development and Humanitarian Affairs at the Permanent Mission of Sweden to the United Nations. We're thrilled to have him as Sweden is ranked number one on the index. Um, and I apologize that we don't have camera, but we have very good audio. So, um, Minister Solstrom, over to you. Thank you very much, Lauren, and thanks to the whole team of, uh, of SDSN uh, for, for the organizing this very timely event. And thank you very much for a very, very interesting report and an excellent uh, presentation by you, Guillaume. I uh, find it fascinating, and I'm sure that, uh, that this report also reaches all the colleagues back home in Stockholm and, uh, and around the world. And, and finally, also thanks, of course, to Ambassador O oh from the Republic of Korea for, for this, this overview and also for your leadership down at the UN in, in, most, in the recent months, uh, also in the discussions about the, the, the UN's uh, response to the COVID outbreak and how to build back better 
uh, including your role as a, as a co-chair of the newly established group of friends uh, of, of Sweden, of course, as a member uh, as well. Um, now, it's a, it's a pleasure, of course, to start the day uh, listening to Jeffrey Sachs, and I wish we can do that uh, every, 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 every Wednesday morning. And of course, uh, it's uh, very pleasing uh, to see that uh, Sweden is again on top of the of the uh, of the ranking uh, on the country ranking on progress towards the SDGs. Uh, we find ourselves uh, in this uh, together with our Nordic uh, neighbors, as you noted, uh, Guillaume, and we find ourselves with our EU partners uh, on top of that ranking. Um, we are usually uh, around there somewhere, but I think what's most not what's most interesting for us and, and for all of us is not so much who is on top and who is on bottom, but where you're going with this. Um, for Sweden, it's clear that there are a couple of things that uh, we have been doing well and we have been doing well for some time together with our Nordic partners. But there's something, uh, for example, on uh, poverty eradication, gender, energy sustainability, I issues like that. But we are, there are challenges as well, uh, consumer product and production uh, sustainability, uh, and our impact on climate, like for many OECD countries. And uh, so there's clearly room for progress for us and uh, most of the, of the higher ranked uh, countries there. Uh, our ranking, I see, is 84, uh, comma, uh, point, uh, 72. That uh, tells me that there is a little bit of a room for improvement for all of us, including Sweden. And I find that the most interesting question is, where do we go from here? Uh, where is the room for improvement and how we achieve that as we build back better and greener? And uh, with that in mind, maybe three, uh, three quick uh, comments, because I'm also interested to hear what, uh, what uh, our audience have to say. But maybe three comments uh, on, uh, on where we need to go now. There are many new things this spring. There is a new world. We uh, live in a COVID world and hopefully soon in a post-COVID uh, world. Um, we work in different ways. Uh, including various platforms virtually and so on. We think in different ways, but uh, maybe counterintuitively, I think we also need to remind ourselves to hang on to our existing policy frameworks. The way to build back better is not a new policy framework. It's the Agenda 2030 and the, and the Paris Agreement. We need to implement those. That's how we build back better. We need to hold on to development, our climate commitments, and we need to hold on to our commitments to democrat democratic governance, human rights and inclusion, including the participation of civil society. When we look around the world, how the world is impacted by the COVID outbreak and, and how we deal with the, with the recovery, all these issues remain important. They remain more important than ever to make sure that we leave no one behind also in this recovery. That's my first point. Second point is that how we do this, um, and it's clear that uh, as we recovered, uh, recover uh, from, from this COVID outbreak, this is not something that uh, we can do isolated as countries, as uh, agencies, as uh, UN body, or as regions. This is something that we need to do together in partnership. We need to work together across uh, issue areas. We speak about different nexus, development humanitarian nexus, security development nexus, health security nexus, lots of nexus. What's clear is that we need to be better at bringing policy areas together and, and uh, work across, uh, across silos and dossiers and agencies. And we also need to work across regions, and this is my third point. Our response needs to be multilateral. We need to do it together with our neighbors in the regions, as for us, the Nordic countries and the European Union. But we need to do it also at the global level through the United Nations and, uh, and uh, together with our leadership uh, under the leadership of the WHO uh, on the health tracks. But we can only do that if we also support those multilateral organizations, if we give them the resources and political and economic support that they need to lead this response. So as we recover better, as we work towards the Agenda 2030, at the climate commitments, as we work in partnership across different policy areas, we must also support those institutions that are leading the work on this. And this needs to be multilateral, a multilateral uh, approach and a lateral uh, um, process. But we cannot then forget about the, the organizations that lead them. So we must ensure that they're supported. Um, and that, of course, this is some, uh, will remain a strong priority for, for the European Union, uh, not least. 
Um, and then finally, um, to say that, uh, and we do it in partnership with with uh, with, uh, with our neighbors uh, in the Nordics and the EU. And uh, just to note that uh, we will, of course, from the Swedish side, be very pleased to participate in future presentations of this report next year. But I think we would be even more pleased to not be invited as a top ranking, but to be surpassed by some other uh, actors. So please uh, f feel free to invite uh, the next year's uh, top, uh, top performing, perhaps the Netherlands or perhaps in Estonia. Uh, we would be perfectly content to sit in the audience next year. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you so much. And I love this idea of a race to the top. Let's see, uh, you know, who can uh, who can take you down and uh, improve so much that they become number one. I love that, you know, very positive sort of competitive spirit. So uh, this is great. We have about 20 or maybe even 25 minutes for some questions and we have quite a lot of them. So we're going to try to do as many as we can, but I apologize to those that we won't get to. I'm going to start with some for Guillaume, specifically around data. We're getting a lot of different questions on data. Three of the common ones are, what is the source of the data that we're using? Um, how many countries are covered in the report? And then um, there are just a bunch of questions around specific country contexts from people who feel that data is um, lacking availability in their country. And so they're also wondering sort of where you're getting data and if anything is estimated um, or if it's all sort of official reported, officially reported data. Thank you, Lauren. No, these are all these are great um, <clears throat> questions. Um, on the source of the data, um, what we do is to use uh, a mix of official um, statistics and uh, unofficial um, statistics. Um, so when I speak about official statistics, what I, I mean really is data that comes from UN custodian agencies to a large extent. Um, uh, that includes you know, the World Bank, WHO, ILO, um, UNICEF, um, UNESCO, and, and other UN custodian agencies. We also use um, data from the OECD, from the OECD um, dashboards. And these official statistics, um, uh, which obviously go uh, through a, a, a very robust process to ensure compatibility and quality, represent about two thirds of our data. 66% uh, of our data come from official statistics. Now, I think it's fair to say that the SDGs are pushing the boundaries when it comes to what we need um, to, to measure. Um, and so um, that includes, for instance, um, international data on the biodiversity um, aspects, but also the issue of spillover uh, effects and consumption-based measures which right now fits primarily outside of um, official statistics. And so a third of the data that we use comes from uh, what we call non-official statistics. That's primarily data from um, academia, research centers uh, that are published in the peer-reviewed literature. So the peer-reviewed process is kind of our equivalent for official statistics of the robust um, processes that are that are there to ensure compatibility and, and quality. Um, and some data also come from uh, non-governmental organizations, and that includes some of data re related to financial secrecy, um, tax havens, um, and, and profit shifting. Um, so that's for the, the, the sources of the data. Um, how many countries are covered by the report? The report includes country profiles for the, all the UN member states. So we have uh, 193 um, country profiles. Um, and the reason why we include um, all of the countries is because the report is obviously a monitoring tool, an accountability tool. So we have the SDG ranking, we have the distance to target, but it's also a tool that is meant to inform where we are missing data um, and which countries are missing you know, which data point. And what we see over the years, I mean, we've been doing this for five or six years now, uh, we see that by um, looking at their result as a country profile and seeing a gray for a couple of specific indicators, this actually pushes sometimes some countries to actually report more data um, to the IMF, to the World Bank, and to other international um, organizations. So it's also a way for us to have uh, a concise way to actually look at how are we doing in terms of data availability. Um, now, out of the 193 UN member states, we include 166 in the SDG index ranking because obviously when we do the index and the scoring, we don't want missing data to be a 
huge bias um, uh, on, on the results. And so we have a rather strict thresholds um, for each country where if we are missing more than 20% uh, of the data, we don't include it into the SDG index and ranking. Um, but at these countries that are not covered, still have a country profile where we report um, the, the detailed data. So that's for the questions on how many countries are covered. On the, the context, um, and the, and the, and which is also related to the missing uh, data issues, I think that's specifically the reason why we also go and do uh, regional um, editions and continental um, editions. Um, there's some cases where we might be missing data at the global level, but where we have much more data available, um, say in Latin America from, from UN ICLAC, um, in Europe with the European Commission, in Africa from the African Union, and other uh, regional and continental um, organization. And that's also in those regional and continental editions that we really contextualize some of the key findings um, and, uh, and, the, and the results, something that we cannot do for the global edition, which really covers very large. But when it comes to the regional editions, we go much deeper um, in really pinpointing where are the data gaps, the, the data issues, but also policy-wise, uh, where uh, would the, the, the main priorities are in terms of uh, implementing the SDGs, the Agenda 2030, and, and climate action. Thank you so much, Guillaume. We also have a large number of questions around climate change, um, decarbonizing economies, reducing deforestation, sort of the, the sort of whole climate package. Um, I'm going to direct a couple of different questions to our different speakers. Guillaume, it would be great if you could comment on um, a, a comment from Kieran who says that Climate action seems to be one of the worst performing SDGs across the board in all countries. Uh, he's wondering if this is correct and why. Um, I think maybe talking about some of the specific indicators that you're tracking and why countries are sort of far from their targets on those would be helpful. Um, I also think this is an interesting question because um, Ambassador O oh mentioned the green recovery that uh, Korea is trying to do as part of their COVID-19 response. And um, Minister Councillor Solstrom also said that uh, sort of climate change is one of the areas where Sweden has a little bit farther to go. Um, so it would be nice if maybe both of you could also comment on um, a couple things that your country is doing or some ways that you're thinking about um, sort of addressing climate change or, or implementing solutions in your countries. But we'll start with Guillaume and then go to um, Ambassador O oh and then the Minister Councillor. Yeah, I'll give a I'll give a very brief answer and really focus on the data that we include in the index and I'll let also other, other speakers mention the, the, the broader context. Um, what we track, and, and this is what I mentioned in my presentation, is that we track both what's happening at the domestic um, level, so um, you know, CO2 emissions at the domestic level, um, but also what's happening in terms of um, spillovers, um, so consumption-based uh, emissions. And the climate goals, so SDG 13, is really bad for um, primarily high-income countries, um, OECD countries, and a number also of uh, medium-income, uh, middle-income um, countries, where they often combine uh, two relatively negative results, which is on one hand, um, high CO2 emissions, and here also the trends are not always, um, this again, until pre-COVID period, the trends were not going necessarily in the, in the, in the right direction. So on the, on the domestic side, um, there are issues. But in addition to that, um, a lot of the high income and OECD countries tend to generate um, a large range of um, uh, climate impacts internationally. Um, through um, unsustainable supply chains and value chains and impacts generated uh, through trade. Um, and so these are really the two um, aspects that lead to a relatively low performance on SDG 13 for a large range of high income um, and, um, and, and middle income countries in the report. Thank you, Guillaume. And um, Ambassador O, oh, any comments you have on sort of Korea's vision for the green recovery? that you mentioned. Yes, I just unmute. Um, um, the uh, climate change has been at the center of the, the government policies uh, throughout the, um, the, the, the period of the, the new government. And uh, we have 
in preparing for the older national response, uh, which are abrogated uh, by the um, uh, climate uh, convention. And but this crisis also gave uh, gives the, some momentum for the government to take um, slightly much more bold uh, uh, actions uh, from past. I mean, there is always a, um, the conflict of interest, and there's always a little bit of a conflict between the environment side of the community as well as the industry, and it is inevitable. And I think it all applies to all countries. So the government has to take a very balanced um, the way to deal with this issue for the whole time. But um, I think it's uh, with the crisis, the green recovery and um, the build back much greener is, is the, I think it's the only way to get out and to build, be build back better and build, uh, even build forward. And I think it's that can gain the, some of the, the acceptance of the public as well. So I'm, I'm quite um, optimistic. Uh, of course, it's a huge challenge for the entire uh, Korean society and also the industry uh, for Korea. But um, I mean, we, the Korea has, has heavily, ex I mean, we, uh, dependent on the trade and, and exports. So I think it's, it's, it's going to be a huge challenge for the industries. But um, this is, the, I think they uh, at least share the notion that this is the only way forward. Thank you Thanks. so much. Um, and Ola, any sort of comments you'd like to add on how Sweden is thinking about this? Um, oh, I think we unmute you. That would help. Apologies. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> thank you so Sorry. much. Thank no, thank you, Lauren, for this, and, and, and thanks for an excellent question. I think this is a question um, we should all ask ourselves every day, how we can do better um, as Sweden, as, as individuals, as government, as, uh, as civil society, as uh, international institutions. I think the, the only way to build back better is to build that back greener. Uh, I, I, don't think we, I, I don't think it would be building back better if it wasn't greener. I think also it happens to be good business. Uh, I think there is a massive investment of, and profit opportunities for those countries and those companies and those uh, entrepreneurs that can capture this moment and uh, develop the, the solutions right now. There is a little bit of a moment in history right now where we have to decide and, uh, and um, I hope that there are, are, are governments and uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, companies that are ready to capture that moment and, and lead the, the way uh, together with countries of course like Sweden and, and uh, Republic of, of Korea. Uh, in Sweden, domestically, when it comes to climate action, we're doing relatively well. Uh, one reason is that we have a, a reasonably good uh, energy mix. Uh, Guillaume mentioned that in his report, that that's one of the targets that we're doing relatively well on. Um, we also do it because there is a deep uh, commitment in Sweden for uh, I mean, conservation of, of nature and climate, uh, climate, climate and things. Uh, in, in the whole population, not least the younger generations, the most the famous uh, example of which is, of course, uh, uh, our very, very impressive uh, Greta Thunberg, who is reminding us uh, that we need to do more and to do better uh, regularly. And, uh, and so I think the challenge for, for us and, and, uh, and for many, many of our partners is rather uh, what Guillaume referred to as the spillover uh, effects, uh, climate effects that are taking place outside the borders of a country, which links to uh, unsustainable patterns of consumption, consumption and production uh, in many developing countries. And, and there, I think, is actually what I mentioned before. Uh, when this is something we need to tackle together through multilateral action, uh, through the Northeast uh, in our region, through the, uh, stronger action through the European Union. And uh, Sweden will continue to, to champion that at the, at the EU, but also at the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I think you made two points that hadn't yet come up that I do think are critical. The role of uh, young people as advocates on all of these issues 
and the role of the private sector. Um, I don't have the citation handy, but I did see a preliminary analysis that companies that um, had certain criteria that made them more sustainable, more green, um, more inclusive, were actually performing a little bit better relative to maybe their less progressive counterparts um, during the sort of economic recessions that we're feeling as a, as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, you also mentioned spillovers, so there are a bunch of questions about that, and I think maybe I will go to one of those. Um, Guillaume, I think it's probably best addressed by you. There are a lot of questions about the charts on spillover effects. Um, some people are wondering if the um, low spillover rates um, are accurate, sort of what we're capturing, what we're missing. Um, how robust is that data, or are there future plans to um, sort of bring in other things that are spillovers that we might not be measuring now. And there's also a specific question in the context of Latin America and Southeast Asia, some countries that have um, relatively high consumption um, as well as high deforestation in country, um, not capturing too many spillover effects. Um, and I think I know that the answer to that um, is perhaps because it's not a spillover, some of it is counted domestically, um, but it would be great to get your sort of official uh, author, statistician uh, response on that. Yeah, no, this is great, uh, Lauren, great questions. Um, I mean, since, uh, uh, we had a Greta Thunberg was mentioned right before. Let me let me also refer to to Greta. I mean, she's actually one of those that has been speaking about this issue of spillover effects when she accused rich countries of creative um, carbon accounting. Um, and what this means is basically taking into account only the, the domestic um, emissions, production-based um, emissions, and leaving outside of this um, emissions that are generated abroad through uh, products that are actually consumed within um, the country, so imported emissions. Um, so to go back to this, to this chart, I think one thing that's very important here to mention is that our indicators are, um, we, in order to not over penalize the size of countries, we use as a denominator per capita. Right? So each indicator is divided on a, on a per capita basis, uh, which is important. So we're not measuring the absolute, we're actually measuring per individual, right? And this is why we have countries like um, Singapore or Luxembourg, for instance, which are relatively small countries with a high trade intensity that actually come up as relatively high on, on this chart and having relatively large spillover effects. But that's because obviously we capture spillovers per person, not in absolute terms. So that's just an important uh, uh, distinction. What we capture here are three types, three broad types of spillovers. One are the ones that are related to um, the environment and biodiversity um, and that are generated through consumption and trade. And here the main tool that we are using are um, what's called multi-regional input-output tables um, that are combined with satellite environmental biodiversity and even increasingly social um, data sets. Um, and here there's, I mean, it's a growing area of work, but we see lots of very interesting estimates coming out, primarily from um, the academic uh, community. Um, and so um, we have been documenting this issue um, for many years um, in this report for, for, for many years. And every year we try to integrate a little bit uh, more indicators. So for instance, this year, one of the new indicators we have is that we're able to separate out impacts that are done on biodiversity threats um, through, the, the, through consumption, both for terrestrial and freshwater versus marine, right? So marine biodiversity threats is covered under SDG 14 and terrestrial and freshwater under SDG 15. Before we only had one single indicator capturing all of this, but we see some differentiated trends when it comes to the impact on marine versus um, terrestrial. So that's the first broad part of spillovers related to environment and, and, and biodiversity. Um, so in terms of indicators here, we have CO2, nitrogen, um, SO2, uh, biodiversity, um, scarce water uh, scarcity. So the, the impact that countries generate on scarce water abroad. The second broad type is related to social and security types of spillovers. And here, through multi-regional input output tables, we're also able to capture uh, the impact that essentially high-income countries are having um, on other countries, um, for instance, on fatal accidents um, at work, 
And here, we're, what we're doing, we're starting a study actually um, to try to see the impact of the textile supply chains um, uh, from the consumption of European countries to um, uh, South uh, Asian uh, countries. Um, and that's basically generated through imports from countries with relatively poor um, labor standards. And then, the, and as part of the social security, we also include some data on those countries that export a lot of conventional weapons um, and that disrupt um, situations uh, abroad. And this is is another, another type of data. It's not based on multi-regional input output table. And then finally, a last set of spillovers that we capture are uh, related to what we could call financial secrecy or, or tax heavens, right? And I think this is captured under SDG 17 that calls for, um, that calls for, for partnerships and, and sound um, fiscal uh, management. And obviously, I mean, tax havens, financial secrecy, they undermine the ability of other countries to levy the resources that are needed to actually invest and achieve um, the SDGs. Um, so here we have uh, indicators from Oxfam, the Tax um, Justice Network, and other estimates uh, on profit shifting uh, produced by, uh, by academia. The big data gap um, here on spillovers for us, and this is something that we, we, we are planning to do much more work on it, is related to um, physical flows, right? So we're able to capture the impact generated through, through consumption, but right now we're not able to capture or to attribute the responsibility of emissions generated by, let's say, a factory that's located at the border of a country and where most of the emissions are actually uh, being accounted to the neighboring uh, countries, right? So that applies to air, uh, air flows, but also water flows. Huh? So pollutions that's being done to a river that goes to uh, another country and that we can we could attribute to the to the to the actual um, country of, of origin. So that's that's a big um, uh, data gap uh, right now, which um, which we aim to fill um, in the in the in the coming years. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're starting to be short on time, but I'm going to try to squeeze in one last round of questions before uh, I turn it over to Christian. For Guillaume, we've gotten a lot of questions about SDG 12 data. Um, people are asking why it is not included in the raw trend data worksheet that's used for the report. Um, but it is included in the SDG index score and the um, rankings. So people are just sort of wondering um, sort of what SDG 12 data we're using, how it was derived and why it is appearing in some places and not others. Um, I also want to give uh, Ambassador O oh and Minister Councillor Solstrom um, some closing remarks. And I think your final point on some of these uh, cross boundary issues is a good one that also links back to some of the questions we've been getting from participants. There are a lot of questions right now coming in around SDG, SDG 17 and the role of partnerships in sort of broadly achieving the SDGs as well as in the COVID response um, and sort of generally questions about the current sort of political situation we're in where many countries are turning away from multilateralism um, and looking a little bit more inward. So um, any thoughts or reflections uh, perhaps from our two country representatives on uh, how we can sort of avoid these worrying trends and foster the kind of collaboration that we need to um, achieve the SDGs and, and respond to COVID. But we'll start with Guillaume. Uh, we'll do the same, same order, Guillaume and then Ambassador O oh, and then Ola. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. That's a that's another great question. I'll be I'll be I'll be brief. I want to make sure that the other panelists have, have time to speak. Um, this is primarily due to um, the low reliability of some of the trend data that we have um, to capture SDG um, 12 um, related to uh, things like waste uh, data over time um, and other data that we that we capture under uh, SDG 12 for responsible consumption and production. So what we do in order to generate a trend arrow is that we try to make sure that we have um, and we do have a threshold. So if we don't have trend data for a certain number of indicators under a goal, we do not generate a trend arrow. And SDG 12 is one of those at the global level where we're struggling to have timely uh, data and enough um, global um, global um, time series estimates for the world. Now, 
in other regional reports, we are often able to actually generate trends. So if I take the case of the European report that we released in November, um, uh, this is a report where a lot of the indicators that we have um, for European countries, we have much more data on uh, recycling rates um, and, and other data that, that matter for, for SDG, SDG 12. But at the global level, it's still an, a, a goal where we see lots of challenges with regards to um, the quality and the timeliness of, of the estimates. Thank you, Guillaume. And um, final reactions, uh, comments from Ambassador O, uh, particularly around SDG 17 and collaboration. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> um, SDG 17, the partnership, is is one of the um, the key principles that we have uh, by the by. I mean, in dealing with the, the COVID. Uh, 19 and I think that's the also the um, the compass to point us uh, in the direction that we need to go so the global solidarity and partnership I think it would be the um, the only option that uh, we can um, have um, to overcome this crisis as well as to build back better um the, the one of the lessons that uh, we had um in dealing with the crisis that um the as the uh, this crisis has ex uh, posed very clearly that uh, the all of the, the economic and social um the structural problems of our times and it gives us an, a stark remo reminder that uh, how important that SDG is that that we have to pursue even in the future. And um, SDGs, I think, will be the, um, the roadmap, as uh, Professor Sachs mentioned, and will be the tool that we have to uh, navigate the, uh, the unclear um, uh, the future. And the, so I think it's, it's, it's time for the older country that um, double its efforts to implement the SDGs and um, all the um, all of the the, the goals uh, uh, should be uh, should not be uh, should be taken very seriously and uh, certainly the Korea will uh, remain very strongly and in solidarity um, uh, in tackling this crisis as well as in uh, fulfilling and implementing the SDGs in the ways ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And Minister Councillor Solstrom. Thank you very much, Lauren. I'll be very brief. I subscribe to everything uh, Ambassador O just said. Um, just to say uh, that uh, for this to happen, uh, for to countries and institutions to um, resist the tendency to look inwards, um, but continue to look outwards, towards your regions, towards multilateral institutions, towards the multilateral uh, cooperation and partnership that we all, I think, understand is needed now. For that, uh, for that what you need is uh, political leadership uh, in the institutions, but also domestically. And I, I, I hope that uh, the leaders uh, today have the foresight and the, the strategic uh, courage to, uh, to continue to look outwards and continue to live, on, uh, on, live up to the commitments. This relates to what I raised uh, earlier, that uh, if you want multilateral solutions, you need multilateral actors and you need to make sure that they have the political and economic support uh, that they need. And uh, that's where we are coming from in Sweden. But uh, we, we would, of course, call upon all the partners to, to continue to support this multilateral system and the multilateral action that is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your comments and apologies that we couldn't get to more questions. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Christian Kroll, one of the authors of the report uh, and a key partner for some uh, concluding and closing remarks. Thank you, Lauren. Well, it is a great pleasure for us uh, to launch our report today with such a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you, first of all, to our distinguished guests. Uh, Minister Sostrom, if I may start with you, uh, your humble interpretation of your very good performance in Sweden is so characteristic of 
what we see from Swedish uh, uh, colleagues and what we see from Swedish audiences uh, over the years in the past uh, in the past years since we've been doing this. So uh, I was talking to a journalist from Dargan's Industry yesterday in the context of our launch, uh, one of the largest uh, papers in Sweden, and I told them not to rest on your laurels in Sweden, uh, but I'm absolutely sure that with your leadership um, there is absolutely a further push uh, for Sweden to get even better uh, in the future and also and that is very important uh, I think to get across to to help other countries because our responsibility in uh, in those countries that are doing pretty well relatively speaking in terms of the SDGs is to help the other countries uh, to strike the right balance of uh, economic social and ecological progress and Ambassador Oh, it was so fascinating to learn about the trust framework which we believe is absolutely the gold standard of how the COVID crisis can be tackled. You've absolutely been leading the way and we're thrilled uh, that you've spelled this out uh, for us and the audience again. Uh, and we do hope that many countries in the world will take this up in the future uh, to learn from, from your experience. And really flattering uh, was your assessment uh, of our work. Uh, I think you said it's something somewhere along the lines of, the SDG index and dashboards should be the navigation system to steer us out of the COVID crisis. Um, that is, you know, a very flattering, but also places a huge responsibility on on uh, on our shoulders, which we take on uh, with hopefully with grace, uh, and we will try to live up to that expectation. Um, what what does come out absolutely strongly of today's discussion uh, and the questions of the from the audience is that cutting edge analysis and, and a sound data to measure progress on the SDGs is more important than ever. You know, when we started this in 2015, it was pretty much seen as a very crazy exercise. You know, how can you do this? It's far too ambitious, 169 targets, 17 goals, statistics from 193 countries. Where do you even start? Um, so we just did, we just started. Uh, and, and this is where we are now. And we're absolutely thrilled to see the demand rise and rise even further over the years from, from communities, from governments, international organizations, NGOs, journalists, activists, ordinary citizens taking up our work and, and really breathing life into it. And that is really what this is about. So we look forward over the next at least 10 years to uh, carry on with you this journey of accountability for the SDGs, of really putting pressure uh, where it should be um, when it comes to progress on the SDGs. And we rely on everyone in the audience and in your networks on giving us feedback. So we're grateful for any constructive criticism, of course. Um, uh, and of course, also do send us your examples of how you're using our report and how it is useful to you and where you think you could, we could do an even better job because we always strive to do better with every report. Um, my final point, I think we've, we're all sort of sharing the sentiment after our great discussion today that humanity really is at a crossroads. Um, we could either now with the COVID break, if you like, and the pause for reflection that this is giving us, we could either carry on with a business as usual scenario afterwards and basically wreck the planet, or we could use the crisis uh, as an opportunity to fundamentally recalibrate. Um, what we see in our data and in our report, Guillaume has, you know, in a terrific way uh, spelled this out earlier, what we see is that there is some progress in, in the environmental SDGs probably due to you know covid and the and the, um, the, the 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 lessening of activities in the economic and social sphere but we shouldn't be fooled this is an illusion um, once we restart the economy uh, with the old recipes uh, and once this is met with devastating economic and social conditions people more people in poverty more people really in desperation um, if we carry on with the old recipes of the past and we restart the engine of the economy, we will be actually worse off than before the crisis. And we can already see the effects in the Amazon rainforest, for example, where the sheer desperation of people there, um, um, you know, basically means that uh, the, the, the Amazon is being um, being um, uh, dismantled. So my final point shall be clever companies use the crisis um, by developing business models that are compatible with COVID-19 and the SDGs and clever governments 
use the crisis by developing policies that are compatible with COVID-19 and the SDGs. We will see that a lot of stuff that we thought wasn't possible before the crisis, you know, this can, can't be done and that can't be done. Actually, now we're seeing that we can be a lot more um, imaginative, flexible and innovative than we thought we would be. And I, we do hope that this will carry on uh, throughout the crisis and really push us closer towards fulfillment of the SDGs. So thank you all for listening in today. Well, thank you so much to all of our distinguished speakers, as well as all of our wonderful participants who joined us. We'll be posting a recording of the meeting online, and we will also uh, try to get to some of the other questions that we weren't able today and try to post some answers. So stay tuned for a follow-up email from us. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us. I wish everybody a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.